Hi, I'm Dr. Carissa Wood. I have been here at IndyVet with the Oncology Department for about three years now. I started straight out of my residency and got the program off and running and was recently joined by my new colleague. Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Hillman. I joined IndyVet in August. Um, actually finished my residency several years ago, um, practiced in a private practice in Memphis for about 14 years, and then made the move to Indiana to join Dr. Wood's team here at IndyVet. And I know we all get into this for a lot of different reasons. Um, for me personally, um, I got into oncology as a third year vet student. Um, I had seen a case with a mentor of mine um, that ended up being a kind of cancer that can cause a problem somewhere else in the body. And I thought that was really, really interesting. And then um, getting to see um, my mentor interact with the clients and really help them through the process of understanding what the diagnosis meant and really alleviate the fear that they developed once they heard the word cancer and seeing that it can go from being a diagnosis of fear to finding out that there is hope and there are treatment options um, there to help and I really wanted to be able to bring that to my clients once I got out of school. Yeah, and I think that you know I'm similar in that regard. You know, I think cancer is something that touches everyone. You know, unfortunately, people hear the word cancer, and it's you know very emotional. You know, many people have been touched by this, and so I think the attraction to veterinary oncology for me is being able to do something for pets that also potentially affects people. And a lot of what we do may be able to help people in the long run as well. And so, um, you know, I think that that's what you know I enjoy about this is being able to help pets and people a difficult time in their lives and hopefully give them some hope and some care when they need it. So the most common cancers in dogs is a tough topic, but um, if I had to pick the ones that we probably see most commonly here at IndyVet, it would be lymphoma. Um, which is a type of cancer that is found mainly in the lymph nodes of our um, canine uh, companions and you can feel those underneath the chin, in front of the shoulders, and behind the knees usually. A lot of us notice it first when we're petting our, our dogs and we feel a lump um, usually on their neck somewhere and um, that's the most common probably cancer we see here currently. Um, another really common cancer that we see is called mast cell tumors. It's a type of tumor that occurs on the skin um, and it's one of the more common cancers that we see. Usually it can look like a raised red mass. It can kind of shrink and it can grow. Sometimes they can bleed a little bit, um, but those are probably the, easily the two most type, common type of cancers we see in dogs overall. Do you have any that come to mind? Yeah, and we will see bone cancer. You know, that's another one that we'll see. Well, dogs will maybe have a limp or a swelling, you know, near a joint area. That's something common that we'll see. And we also see a lot of skin tumors. You know, like Dr. Witt said, mast cell tumors are very common, but there can be other lumps and bumps that, you know, that should be evaluated by you, your primary care veterinarian or us here at IndyVet just to make sure they're not something of more concern. So when you make an appointment here at IndyVet, you'll have an appointment with either myself or Dr. Wood. And usually when you come in for the appointment, we ask that you bring your pet, you know, just so we can examine your pet as well. Um, and then we want to go through the history. One of our nurses will come in the room with you, go through the history, you know, talk about medications that your pet is on. It's very helpful for us if you bring a list of medications so we know exactly what your pet has been taking previously. Um, and then we go through the history, do a physical exam, and then we talk with you about next steps. In many cases, we may need to do further testing to better clarify your pet's cancer and figure out, has it spread somewhere else in the body? So we can do that for a variety of tests like x-rays, ultrasound, you know, taking samples with a small needle, sometimes CT scans. You know, there's many tests that we can do to try to, to determine where your, cat, where your cat or dog is you know, as far as this cancer. Um, and then once we go through the test, we'll talk with you about results. Some of those come back the same day, some come back a few days later, but we'll go through everything with you and make a treatment plan that fits you and your pet. You know, that's the most important thing that we focus on is quality of life. So we want to make sure that we have a plan that, that works for you as well as for your pet when we go through cancer treatment. I think the most important thing for people to know coming in for their appointments is that 
cancer is scary. It's a scary diagnosis and even though we do this all day, every day, even for us as pet owners ourselves, it's a very scary diagnosis for us to hear if it was our own cat or dog. Um, it's because it's scary, we want to make sure we're doing things in steps and that we have the answers needed in order to give the best treatment options and to give the information as far as kind of what the expectation is moving forward. The one thing we don't ever want to do is make assumptions about what a pet has as far as a diagnosis because that won't allow us to provide the best information and the best treatment plans and so the, the stepwise approach and making sure we have all the tests, all the answers is, is really key before kind of jumping all in and talking about all the ins and outs of treatments and prognosis moving forward because no one ever wants to, to be told something bad um, unless we know that that's really where things are going to go and so we want to make sure that we're always keeping in mind that things aren't always what they seem and there could be other explanations or treatment options on the table um, for each individual pet. So this is something I get made fun of for a lot by my friends and family um, when we are out um, just either taking a walk or just um, at the dog park when I see certain breeds and I'm like, oh, I wonder if they need a vet. Um, it's because there are certain breeds that are more predisposed to developing cancer than others. Um, easily at the top of every oncologist list are golden retrievers, unfortunately. They are um, at the top of the list for just about every cancer, um, including lymphoma, um, hemangiosarcoma, mast cell tumors. Um, they kind of range the gamut across the, the board, and so those, that is a particular breed that we always are watching for. Um, the ones that kind of pop into my mind, and they may be different from what Dr. Hillman thinks of, are breeds, the black and tan breeds, the Doberman Pinchers, um, the Rottweilers, and then um, I do consider German Shepherds the black and tan breeds. Um, they're always at the list. Um, and then the Boxer, unfortunately, is right up there with the Golden Retriever and being um, really at risk for a lot of our cancer types, unfortunately. Um, in the Boxers, we do see a high number of mast cell tumors, that skin tumor that we had talked about earlier. Um, and then as far as kind of the smaller breeds that um, I think about, um, that gets a little bit tougher, but um, I would say that um, we do see a fair number of the terrier group in general. Um, Scotty, Scottish terriers are um, commonly seen for things like bladder cancer and then also things like liver tumors. Um, and then we also have the Cocker Spaniels that like to get things like um, oral melanomas. Um, but those are kind of the ones that I really um, think about. And then my all time kind of, when I see it in the clinic, I kind of walk right up to it and I start feeling lymph nodes and just kind of chatting up and seeing why it's here are Bernie's Mountain Dogs. Unfortunately, um, they're a, a great dog, but they're very, very predisposed to developing one particular cancer as well as a couple others. Um, and in fact, upwards of 60% of Bernie's Mountain Dogs um, will actually die from one particular cancer called histiocytic sarcoma. So it's really important to be aware of that as an owner if you're going to um, consider adding one of these breeds to your family and understanding that they're predisposed to these things and we need to plan for them down the road. And um, things like pet insurance can help um, with costs um, and it's great to not have to worry about that later on. As far as cats go, um, I have a huge interest in treating cats. Um, I, I absolutely love cats. Um, and we don't really see a particular breed too often in cats. Um, most are just domestic short hairs um, and domestic long hairs, though the Siamese does tend to get a lot more of the cancers um, than other breeds out there, but we don't see a, a large number here um, in Indiana Indianapolis. Um, but those are really the ones I think of. Yeah, and I, I don't ever discount the mixed breed dog. You know, a lot of people, you know, you go to the, the shelter and you rescue a pet, and so, you know, mixed breed dogs, we do see them as well. You know, so I think anytime you have a concern, the most important thing, you know, is to talk to your primary care veterinarian. You know, they can get your referral to see us here at IndyVet if needed. You know, we just want to, you know, take care of, of any concerns that you have, you know, regardless of the breed as well.
So when we talk about treatment options available for cancer in pets, it's very similar to what you might hear about in people. You know, we do surgery for pets, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, but the difference between veterinary medicine and when we treat pets versus treating people is we try very hard to minimize the side effects as much as possible. You know, our most important concern is to maintain a good quality of life at all times. You know, no one can explain to the pet that they have cancer, so our job is to make sure they have as many good days here with us as possible. So we do use you know, the same chemotherapy drugs people get, but dogs and cats actually tolerate them really well. Um, you know, the instance of side effects is fairly low compared to what people experience. Um, so I do think all of these treatment options you know, can be used sometimes alone, sometimes in combination. You know, it really just depends on the type of cancer as to what treatment option we feel is best for your pet. But overall, they do tolerate cancer treatments extremely well. Um, so that's an important thing to focus on when we think about these treatments in pets. As far as um, treatment options go, we, we can do basically everything in veterinary medicine that they are utilizing in human oncology. The, the biggest question I always seem to get um, is whether or not cats in particular can receive um, treatment for their cancer. Um, no one ever seems to hesitate to consider dogs for treatment, but it is a big question we get with regards to our feline patients. And in my experience, cats do great with treatment for their cancer. Um, they're very tolerant. They actually adapt very well to the frequent visits. Um, we have one that's here with us right now and he loves being here. Um, he, he has his routine and he really loves interacting with the staff and he likes his his visits um, and the treats that he knows he's going to get and he knows exactly when he's ready for them and he, he always lets us know it's time. Um, it's a it's definitely something we're working to help owners understand that cats can handle all forms of therapy just as well as dogs can. Um, it's just there may be a little bit louder about it in the car on the way here. That's perfectly fine. Um, we have ways we can help with that as well. Um, there are definitely um, different ways to enrich the environment and to help make car rides less stressful for them. But at the end of the day, I do find that cats actually have an even lower um, side effect rate than dogs do to their treatment. Um, and they, they just really sail through and do awesome. Um, and I think it's, it's something that um, I would love owners to, to really know before they come in um, for their appointment or when they're considering referral that um, being a feline patient definitely does not exclude you from treatment um, and it does not exclude you from even potentially aggressive treatment um, because they do very well. Another common question we get a lot of the time is how can I as the owner help my pet through their cancer therapy and their diagnosis because it, you can feel helpless and you can feel like you, you are unable to, to help them um, and you want to make sure that you're doing everything that you can on your side. I know that I have felt that way personally as a pet owner um, when I was given the diagnosis of cancer in my dog and it really comes down to just making sure that there's a really open line of communication between you and your oncologist. Um, we're here to help, we're here to support you no matter if we're doing palliative care or we're doing aggressive multi-modality treatment with radiation surgery and chemotherapy, all treatment is always done in the aim of ensuring that the patient has a good quality of life and it's a team effort. Um, and it starts at home with you guys talking to us about things that are happening at home, any concerns you have, any, any questions you might have. If you come across something on the internet, if you're out looking and talk with us, we're happy to review it, we're happy to talk to you, talk to you about kind of what it is the pros and the cons of it, and to really make sure that every patient has an individualized treatment plan. Um, and then just being there for your pet. Um, it's scary because you know what's going on, but they also know how you are feeling. And so just making sure that you're giving them lots of attention and that you're being there for them um, and making them feel very loved and very supported is gonna be really the best things as an owner that you can do. Um, throwing in a couple extra treats every now and then certainly not gonna go wrong. Um, they're definitely gonna enjoy that. Um, and then it's just about talking with us and, and us working together. And if you, you know, when we do chemotherapy in pets or do certain treatments, we usually send you home with medications to have on hand in case your pet does have an upset stomach, you know, or doesn't want to eat well. You know, those are things that we try to prepare you for while your pet's going through treatment, so you'll have options on hand at home so you're ready for those things. 
Um, you know, we're here during the week. The emergency hospital here at IndyVet is open 24-7. So you always have a resource if you're concerned about your pet and you're worried they're not doing well. You know, we always have someone here that can help you. So probably one of the most frustrating things as an owner um, is when you hear us say that we are not going to be able to cure the cancer. Um, this is something that I know a lot of oncologists feel very passionately about that there is a perception out there that cancer has to be beaten, it has to be battled, it has to be fought against and cured and, and we, have to, we have to beat it. Um, it's funny because you don't hear people going around um, saying that we have to cure diabetes or beat heart disease or any other chronic condition. Um, we know that those are, are diseases that we're going to have to treat and we're going to have to manage and they're probably going to be for the lifetime of the patient. Cancer's really no different. It's a disease um, and it can be treated like any other chronic disease and be managed in a long-term fashion. Um, at the end of the day, most conditions out there as far as medicine, if we can't just cut it out, um, they really are things that need to be managed long-term and that is a shift in perception that I think is gonna be very important for owners because it'll take away a lot of the stress, um, a lot of the emotional ups and downs that come with treatment along the way. When we start to think of it more as um, chronic management and as a disease that we're going to um, deal with and that we're going to make the patient feel better and um, stop having so much focus in the fact that we need to make it go away um, because you're not going to ask us to make the heart disease go away, you're gonna ask us to manage it and really that shift needs to happen for cancer therapy as well and we are going to find that with that shift um, there's a lot more satisfaction and a, and a lot but, um, more focus on the patient and, and quality of life and, and really just a better um, overall feel for everybody involved um, and I really think that owners will find a lot of the, the fear and anxiety is relieved by just kind of shifting how we think about things and approach things when it comes to cancer because We've been made to fear it in a way that we don't fear anything else in medicine, and that fear leads to a lot of the negative emotions that is associated with treatment and referral.